My name is Aya Anelli, and I am going to be your mistress of ceremony for today, and we're really excited to have you all here. At this point, I would like to introduce a man who needs no introduction whatsoever. He kind of owns this place. Like if you hadn't noticed, the building is named after him. Dr. Anderson is, um, is an ex-chancellor for Central Texas College. He was a chancellor for this, this college for 24 years. So yeah, we can give him a round of applause for his great service. But being the, the man that he is, he continues to serve in our community. He's on the board of directors of the Texas Association of Community Colleges. He serves on the Armed Forces YMCA board. He's also on the Central Texas Workforce Board. And of course, cheers the CTC Foundation. He's going to bring our welcome and maybe tell you a little bit about himself and what he does here with the foundation. Without further ado, Dr. Anderson. Dubbed the African American Experience, you're going to be delighted about this special program that we're all about to see and hear and enjoy. And the Center for African American Studies is and has been uh, a pretty important part of the Central Texas College Foundation for some time now. And it's been instrumental in assisting the college in a variety of ways, which will be further explained uh, this evening by another speaker. Uh, the program this evening is being presented without charge. Uh, and I hasten to tell you, of course, that that doesn't mean it's without cost. Uh, the expense is being borne by past donors who have shared a common goal, and that was simply to exist, assist African American history in America. Those of you here this evening, I think, will find those goals worthwhile, and those who are able to contribute. I will be given some assistance later on this evening uh, to learn how to do that and maybe continue to help in the future. Well, let me conclude by, by reiterating how delighted we are uh, to have you attend our program. I thank you for coming on behalf of the Foundation Board, but I want to make a special thanks. Some years ago, he didn't have a dream, but he had a vision. That was Horace Grace who was the vice chair of the College Foundation. And when this happened years ago, uh, he came to myself and, and others who were on the foundation board and laid out his plan for what would be this event and other events like it. And I want to tell you, those other events have been successful. The one tonight is going to be successful and enjoyable. And it would not have happened without Mr. Horace Grace. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. At this time, we will have our invocation by Reverend David Reynolds, pastor of Greater Vision Baptist Church. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, our Father, we bless you for this day, and we'll pray, O oh God, now that you will give us strength and that you will provide us with joy and information that we might be able to ride this road together. And we thank you and we bless you now. This we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 Well, thank you all. This is a good day. And I am honored to be here and share with you some of my thoughts about getting and tell you how we got the center off the ground. I'll go back and tell you that I was in physical therapy one day with a lady by the name of Great L. Duncan. The Duncan family is well known in this community. And she said, Horace, I've written two books, and I can't find anything uh, that relates to African Americans. Something's wrong with that picture. Because where you find successful whites, there has to be blacks in the background. And she told me that I need to get after it and uh, get something done about that. Well, four months went by. I didn't do anything. And this wouldn't go away. And uh, I said, more than Horace Grace is dealing with this, this is a higher be being telling me that I need to do something about that. So uh, one day I went in to see Dr. Uh, Anderson, as he just stated, told him what my ideas were, and he said, aren't your plate already full? And uh, we both agreed that it was. But he said, look, if you want to try to pull this off, get your committee together, and I will support it 100%. So that was the beginning of the center. That's how we got it off the ground. 
So uh, what we decided to do, the purpose of the center uh, was to gather resources about the contributions of African Americans and provide it to our community, just like we're doing. We're living it tonight to, to get this data together understand each other, and then we can begin to build bridges. So that's what we did. And so we started out first buying books. The, the community, you all, we came together. Uh, one, one night, I think we made $25,000 at a gala right here in Colleen, Texas. I think Judge Cook was a part. He's always been hanging around every one of these galas that I perform and contributing. But we raised the money and we uh, purchased $8,000 worth of books, oral history type books, and we placed them in the Oveda Cup Library here at Central Texas College. And you can go and access those books anytime you'd like by either putting my name in or putting in the Center for African American Studies and Research. So that was the number one task of the center, and we got it uh, accomplished. The second task we decided to do was, it goes back to Ms. Uh, 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 Duncan's comment. How can we do oral history? So I uh, approached a professor of history, Dr. Stan Dyer, who was teaching history at Tarleton State, graduate level, and, I, uh, uh, and he was teaching also at CTC. And he and I got together, and we decided that we were going to have students to do uh, the oral history. Go around to individuals' homes and ask them questions, people who were living here in the 40s and the 50s. So we ended up doing at least 15 families. So we have those 15 families that we interviewed and uh, that's in the Bell County Museum right now. And uh, Dr. Jerry Jones, who's here from Texas A&M, tells me that we are going to do better. We're, go we, we're going to start this all over. So Texas A&M is going to participate with us in continuing the oral history effort. So that was the two second project that we got going. And then we said, well, we, we need to come up with some scholarship money. So well, let's go back to the community and see if the community will uh, give us some more money for scholarship. Well, I'm here to tell you today that we have raised $40,000 just in one endowment now, the Center for African American Studies. We have raised $40,000 that's endowed, and it pays uh, two scholarships a year. We've done about 30 scholarships so far. So we want you to help us continue to keep that, that going. So, you know, one of our top uh, commentators uh, uh, is in the area, and he's retired by the name of Roscoe Harrison. I said, Roscoe Harrison? Roscoe and I went to college together. And when I came here in 1979, I was shocked to see a black uh, as, a, as a number one commentator on KCN. So uh, Roscoe and I got together, and we talked, and uh, I offered to hire him <coughs> for a dollar a year. <laughs> So it took us a couple of months. He wouldn't budge. He said, I can't go for a dollar a year. But he decided, say, OK, Horace, if you uh, give me $2, I'll take the job on. So I got him negotiating. He's still under contract. So uh, we, uh, we do the program. The program comes on every Friday, uh, every fourth Friday of the month at 8.30. Uh, we've gotten good reviews. And it comes on uh, that fourth Friday on Sunday also at 10 o'clock. So um, we'd like for you to look at that program. And it covers all aspects of the community. And we try to get the word out. And we've been doing this ever since uh, 02, I believe, Roscoe, don't you think? Long time. <laughs> <laughs> so you're here tonight. All 225 of you, I think that's how many chairs we got in here. but. Uh, we're here tonight to hear a lecture that's coming up. Uh, um, so we will uh, have, if he gets here, he's been delayed our, our keynote. So we hope that he'll get it here in time. But we started the lecture series, and we got it going. And we'd like for you all to help us continue. So if you like this, 
just continue to support us. And one other thing I want to make just one comment on, the power of three people involved in getting the center off the ground. Great L. Duncan, who's, we lost her two years ago, myself and Dr. Anderson. If any one of those people had a fell out, we wouldn't be here today. So I want to say to the students, I think that's the way you're going to have to live your life. You just got to say, I can do it. Don't let anything stop you from accomplishing your goals. And if you think you're getting weak, just call any of us. Any one of these three on the panel, uh, go talk to your friends, but just make sure you do what you're going to do. And I want to make one other point. We have, uh, with the community now, Here's a community working with Central Texas College and Texas A&M. We decide to do a collaboration, the three entities working together. And just look how beautiful that is. And we got, uh, I think in the room tonight, we got uh, the Warriors. Do we have any Warriors here? Go oh! All right. The Warriors is here. Do we have any Eagles? Uh, okay. Well, Eagles, Eagles is CTC, Warriors is Texas A&M. The Warriors are here to talk to Eagles and when they finish up here for two years to go to Texas A&M. Let me tell you, folks, especially the parents. Uh, how's my time going? Uh, you, can, you can go to CTC and Texas A&M, Central Texas, for less than $18,000 with a BS degree. Now, have you ever heard of anything? I think if you go down to uh, A&M, uh, and I'm not knocking A&M main campus, but it, you could spend that in, in, for one semester. So why are we leaving town? You all have to ask yourself, why are we doing that? So think about that, spread the word, and thank you all for coming, and I'm gonna turn it over to the moderator. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, our panel for tonight, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started with Ms. Mrs. Calloway. Thank you. I think they, they told us that we have three to six minutes, is that correct? And yes, then we'll do and I'm timing you. Okay, perfect. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I'm Tracy Calloway, and I come from a very small town, about an hour away from here, and you've probably never heard of it, because it's called Marlin. <laughs> All right. Oh, that means you've ventured out of the Metroplex. Oh, there we go. Oh, hi. That's my neighbor. Hi. What a small world. That really is my neighbor. Yes. Okay. So it really is. Marlon's so small, right? It's just the two of us there. And I go, yeah. So, um, so, so it is an hour away. And I grew up in a very small community. And I say that because my mom's from there. My dad's from there. My grandmother's from there. My father's mother's from And so everybody's from there. And I remember when I had an opportunity to go off to, and I, I went to Texas A&M at College Station, but I had an opportunity to go to University of Texas in Austin. And my mother said, oh, no, you're, you're not going there. Somebody's going to uh, put something in your drink. And so I said, oh, OK, I don't even drink, but all right. So, so I went off to Texas A&M, and I got an undergraduate there. And while there, I had an opportunity to go work um, on Capitol Hill. And I told my mom that, and she said, oh, oh no, you, you can't go there because I saw in hard copy that, that, that something would happen to you in Washington, D.C. And so I said, you know what? I didn't go to University of Texas. I've, I've just got to understand the mindset. So I went to Washington, D.C. And so, so and I, w I had an opportunity to continue to build on that. Uh, after graduation, I went to work for a congressman in the area. And I got the opportunity to meet the Horace, who, who he says I'm his adopted daughter. And I'll, I'll, I'll vouch for that. Um, <laughs> And so I was able to do that, and then I was able to return to Texas A&M to graduate school and, and get my master's in business. And from there, my career took off in HR. But one day I decided, you know what? I, I can't believe people go to work every day from 8 to 5. <laughs> and I'm supposed to do that for like 40 years? Is Like, when am I supposed to do stuff for me? And 
all of a sudden I started thinking, there's got to be a better way. And so based on that, I started, I bought my first property, and, and I'm going to say, I get, Horace came into play with that. And, and so that's a, that's a little bit longer story. But Horace is able to be a resource for me to buy my first property, which is now uh, a, a rental property for me, and I continue to build on that. Uh, eventually, my career took took off with the MBA, and I was able to invest in additional real estate. And so I have multiple income streams, and I work because I want to work, and I enjoy my job. So, um, so, so just based on that, I'm going to give you three things, and, and I put it on my phone because I want to stay on task, because I've probably got three minutes now. Uh, but I just want to uh, talk a little bit about three things that I think it has been very successful and, and, and helped me uh, in my road. And the first thing is, uh, what I say is, you got to do you. And I, I hear a lot of times, just being in HR and uh, being an entrepreneur and starting your own business, a lot of times people will say, well, they won't let me. They won't, they won't let me take that class I need to get the, to the next level. Or they won't let me do this. And I say, well, OK, I want to understand the whole let part. Because you've got to do you. You've got to be in control of you. Nobody's going to just pop out of the woodwork and say, you know, I randomly think I'm going to help you today. And I'm randomly going to do that. And so you've got to take those reins. And that's me being responsible for you, knowing that your actions result in conflict consequences, whatever that is. Um, you've also got to um, know that you are in control of how people perceive you. And, and now with social media, people will put everything out there. And of course, you go, oh my gosh, did they just put that out there? And it's a, it's a different culture we're living in. But also understand that you've got to protect your brand. How people perceive you and react to you is how you present yourself. That's just kind of how, how we think about it. So, so keep that in mind. Uh, second thing, so first thing, you've got to do you. Make whatever you want to do, do it. Go out and go out and seek how to do it. Second thing is educate yourself, which ties into that. Is I always say, and I have the saying where I say, everything is possible with God and Google. I, I, just have, I just have that saying. It's like, I swear, I sit in for, I don't leave any place with this, and I'm always saying, I'm going to look that up. Oh, why does that work that way? Or how do I do that? There are videos now. There's somebody's done it before. And my whole thing is, if they did it, maybe I can tweak it a little differently and do it better. So it's already, it's already out there. So ask questions. You know, I had this conversation one time with someone, and I was, I was so excited about him thinking about going back to school and working on his trade. And I realized he wasn't as passionate as I was. And I said, OK, so here's the deal. I will support you. I'm going to be so excited about what you're doing. But I don't think I need to be more excited than you. Because I can take that excitement and that energy and channel it to something else. And I think he got the message, and he started doing whatever he needs to do. And he's a very successful barber now in, in Austin, Texas. Um, but that was another thing. So educate yourself. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean, and it's, it's great, you're going to school, and we have warriors here and eagles here, and, and that's awesome. But educate yourself also means to find out about whatever it is your craft is, your trade is. And you don't just have to read about it, experience it. Um, in in um, Marlin, Texas, I worked at the chicken place. And y'all might know it when you pass through, but I was 17, I worked at the chicken place, and the owner was 25. And he, I think he spent a year at Rice, but he was 25, and he said the secret to his success was, if you want to go and, and own a business or do something, work in the industry. And I remember just, just being naturally curious about, well, well how, does, how does all this work, this, this running your business work, and how do you manage the money and the payroll, and, and what does this mean? And, and so I was constantly educating myself about that. So another thing, too, is I had a conversation today about somebody who wanted to enter the field of HR. And when I looked at his resume, it talked about being a server in a restaurant. And I said, well, you know what? You've got to get some HR experience. Well, how do you get that? That goes back to number one, right? When, when I said, you got to do you. They, they don't let you. You've got to let yourself. And one thing I told him was like, get the experience. If you volunteer, you know what? That's experience. A lot of times when I talk to people, too, I'll say, what are you afraid of? What is your biggest fear? And then I'll break it down and I'll say, what's the very, very next step you need to do? Well, do that very next step. So volunteer. Get your experience. Educate yourself that way. Last thing, manage your resources. 
And when I say resources, I mean your time. Um, time is very valuable. You know the last five minutes that just went by? We'll never see that again. And so you've got to maximize that and you've got to say, what did I get from those five minutes that's going to help me with my next five minutes? I also read something where sometimes we manage our time per hour. They say the most effective way of, of doing it is per 15 minutes. So, so can you imagine that? Sometimes I'll start my day where I'm, I'm writing down, this hour I'm going to do this, this hour I'm going to do this, this hour I'm going to do that, and then I'll start checking stuff. So manage your time. That's a very valuable resource. You'll never get it again. There was a commencement speaker who's very wealthy, T. Boone Pickens, very, very wealthy. And he talked to a commencement class and he said, I, do you know how much money I would give to be 22 again, or 25 again, or 30 again? And every day I say, you know what? Okay, I'm this age right now. When I'm 60, am I going to go back and go, wow, if I were 40 something again? Or when I'm 40, am I going to go think, wow, if I were 25 again? And so I live every day with knowing how valuable time is. So manage your resource. Second thing I was talking about is manage your money. Um, so when I think about, and I, I do a class called How to Become a Millionaire, and, and, and I, I think the key to that is live below your means. My classmates from college are so surprised when they come see me because they're like, wait, is this the same person? And I was like, well, yeah, you know what? I didn't have a lot in college, so I wasn't spending a lot. And now it's like I've achieved a certain level where I still manage it because it's precious, the same with time. Third thing I want to talk about with managing resources is your people. You are your company. So one, and, and I play a lot of golf, but there's this one thing about how to increase your golf score, and one thing they say is play with people better than you. Are there golfers in here? Are there, you laughing at it? Okay, all right, so play with, oh, you're excited about that, aren't you? Play with people better than you. And so, and that's the whole thing is you've got to manage your company and your people. So three things, all right? Do you educate yourself and manage your resources? Thank you so much. Uh, my story is just, uh, my life is, I, I go around sharing, um, I'm from Colleen, Texas, went to Ellison, uh, went off to uh, Oklahoma University, was a first round draft pick, um, uh, Lombardi Award winner, Pro Bowl stuff, first, all that stuff, you know, and um, I ended up being the first to make 10 million in it. I mean, Hey, you, I'm a talk for real. I'm home, so it's Colleen. So, I uh, I end off being the first to ever make 10 million per season and the highest paid defense lineman to ever be in the NFL. And I thought I had my life figured out. Hey, you ever heard that saying? If you want to got make God laugh, try planning your life. So, um, but I've always been a seeker, a seeker of truth, of a seeker of the light, and uh, I am. Um, I began to go do things while I was playing. It just nothing would suffice. Money wouldn't, fame wouldn't, anything. Nothing would. It was still another thing. And I want to tell you all, I see so many people talk about money and, and, and all this. I hear sayings that says, uh, people say money's not nothing, but everybody wants it for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> to find out for themselves. So I'm respectful of that also, but just my viewpoint of having it and, and getting to the top, uh, so-called top, um, I realized throughout my journey that your job is to be grateful where you're at. And I begin to, I begin to, <laughs> thank you. I begin to uh, constantly just Ask God. I remember going to one game and I began to, my mom called me. We would pray before every game and I said, Mom, I'm tired of all of this. And at this time, I mean, I'm up for defensive player of the year. I'm rocking it out. I got the car, my dream, the house, the stuff. Like, I'm, I got it going. You hear me? Like, I'm doing my thing. But something still wasn't clicking. I still wasn't satisfied. And I realized I had started making a lot of different choices in my life and decisions that I was leaving where I came from and the beginning understanding that I had. And there were different things I started to go through. And I, 
I remember getting married after um, my first contract deal, and I ended up uh, having a son, a beautiful son. And uh, after that, about a year later, I ended up having a daughter. About um, And three months into that, my wife passes away. So everything shatters at this point. I remember going to the airport and she was flying to, um, she was flying to Oklahoma and we had just got married and we were only married for 41 days and our big wedding was gonna be June 8th. We got married on New Year's and I'm gonna hurry it up, I know. We got to, we, so I got married on New Year's and um, we end up, uh, we were gonna have a big wedding on June 8th and after we, um, we didn't make it to that, my wife ended up uh, flying out. I was going to the airport, here we go. I was going to the airport to Oklahoma. My wife was in Oklahoma and I got a phone call. I was landing in Austin, Austin and I was on the plane with a man that owned a jet company and it was random how God does things. And this man was on the plane with me next to me and I was bragging about my wife the whole time and the story about my family when I landed. Uh, the people where my wife was getting her surgery at said to me, your wife is not breathing. She's unresponsive on the machine. You need to get here. So I run into the airport. I'm trying to find a flight. There's no flight to get me over to Oklahoma. So I remember the guy gave me a business card. I call him up and he says, hey, I'll send you a jet in Colleen. I'll be waiting for you. So when I get to Colleen, I say, Mom, I need you to come with me. I got to go. I, I, I got to get out of here. And then I, uh, my mom comes with me, but on the runway, a rays begin to come down. All these lights begin to come down. And there was just a piece in my soul that God said, this is it. Like everything you've ever asked for, that testimony. You remember that? <laughs> God, I want to be different, and I want to be change the world, and I want to do all the, be careful what you ask for. Yeah. So I knew that that trip, my life was immediately going to change when those wheels hit that other runway. And as I got off that plane, I remember sitting in there for three days praying to God and telling God, God, you do this for me, and God, you do this. And then the last third day, the third day, I said, God, let your will be done in my life. And right when I said that, the doctor walks in and says, your wife passed. I literally went in there and I stood up and I believe that God you got to keep me through this and though you slay me what feels like the slaying I would trust you and I stayed in the race and over this time I've been able to just tell people and encourage people this too shall pass and it won't be like this always and it's a Nehemiah talks about what 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 affliction that happened to me has goaded me closer it's for some reason a day smells different and I can realize sunshine now and I don't believe in crying and complaining and we all have it but you don't have to wait to lose somebody to get it so that's what I go around teaching or I go around not even teaching but reaching you see people with so much in their lives and one percent goes wrong out of the 99 percent and they live and beat themselves up over the one percent that didn't go right and I call it the kid getting his toy taken away syndrome. As soon as you are satisfied with getting that 12K, I threw my temper tantrum. Oh, God has an abundance stored up of toys. I got to get over me. That's mine, mine. Oh, that was mine and mine. And then I beat myself up for losing. And when will you get over and trust God? There. And that's what my story is. And now, and I also have an MBA um, from University of Miami. I went back to get my MBA. So don't, but I go around and I share that because that's the most important thing. Just remember the light. You all are flames on the side of a mountain. Keep climbing. Right. Keep climbing. I want to thank, first of all, Horace Grace, my old classmate. No, he was a year ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> at Prairie View a &M University. And uh, well, it wasn't the university then, it was Prairie View a &M College. I came from a small town. When I got to Prairie View, though, I had already attended Temple College, well, it was Temple Junior College, a couple of years. And I went to Prairie View as a junior. And Horace was big in the ROTC. He was a battalion commando. And ROTC. Now that was something that was, I found out after I got to Prairie, you still had to fulfill that obligation. We called it the war. 
<laughs> and uh, so I was a buck private and he was a battalion commander. <laughs> but he's been a friend of mine for 50 years. Uh, tell you a little story about me. I, I truly believe I am now the pastor of A Street Baptist Church. I've been there 15 years. But, and I'm 72 years old. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, I truly believe that we can do all things through Christ, who gives us the strength, despite social adversity. Because we went through that age, I went through that age, Horace went through that age of social adversity. I grew up in Belton, Texas. I was born in 1944. And at that time, when you and I was growing up in Belton, that was a time of art segregation. We couldn't even play in the city park. We couldn't go anywhere, but we were limited as to what we could do. But when I turned 16 years old, see, I had a pushy father. My father worked at Cochran Blair and Post Department store for 44 years. He started there in 1923 at the age of 21. And he, they made him a porter and a janitor. And those days, big department stores had porters. They carried your packages to the car. And they found out he had been to business school. So he, they made him a store clerk. He was the first black store clerk in Central Texas. That meant he could wear a white shirt and a tie. You see, and so as we were, he, Daddy always believed that, we could, that I could do anything. He said, because you can do things that I couldn't do. So when I turned 16 years old, I wrote a radio show. He made me write it. <laughs> and we presented it to a man named Frank Mapern. And the way we got to Frank Mapern is that my father knew a lady named Ms. Mady Smith, who was the Belton Bureau Chief of the Temple Daily Telegram. And Ms. Mady knew Frank Mapern. And she went to Frank Mapern and she told him about me. Frank Mabin sent me to his radio station. At that time, he owned KTEM radio. And I went to his radio station and met a man named Ralph Burgess. And I was on the air at the age of 16 doing a show called Variety of Talent. We had choirs from churches and from black schools. The a cappella choir, some of you that are old as, almost as old as me, you can remember the old a cappella choirs that we had in, in the high school. I went to Harris High School, you never heard of it, in Belton, Texas. That was the black high school. I would, that was Dunbar High School in Temple, where me and Joe Green went to school. I played football against me and Joe Green. I'm, I live to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Another. Thank you. We're very proud to be part of this event, part of the center and its mission. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker tonight. Leonard Moore is the George Littlefield Professor of American History and Senior Associate Vice President, Division of Diversity and Community Engagement at the University of Texas. His PhD in history is from Ohio State University, which uh, I didn't get my PhD at Ohio State, and I've always been jealous of those who did. It's regarded as one of the, probably the top history program in the country. Dr. Moore, Dr. Leonard Moore, is the author of two books, Black Rage in New Orleans, Police Brutality, and African American Activism from World War II to Hurricane Katrina and Carl B. Stokes and the Rise of Black Political Power. He teaches courses in African American history, the Black Power Era, the history of black nationalism, and the history of the hip hop generation. He is the National Urban League Whitney M. Young, uh, received, received that award for Urban Leadership and Education. 
and is also the recipient of the NAACP Image Award for Best Nonfiction Book. Please help me welcome Dr. Leonard Moore. Thank you. On the night of the election, me and my wife, we live in Round Rock. On the night of the election, a lot of us were up 1.32 in the morning waiting for the results. And at around 1.45, um, <coughs> we heard some noise outside in our, our neighborhood. And my wife said, wow, it must be raining. The th it's thundering pretty hard. And I said, no, those are fireworks. People in our neighborhood were celebrating, right? That Trump um, had won the election. And, and the next day, and you know, in a couple weeks, people are mourning, right? Uh, my white friend's crying. And I said, black folk, we're used to this. <laughs> this ain't nothing new to black folks. And I had to tell my students that if you understand African American history, you understand that during the Jim Crow period, which is marked by lynching, disenfranchisement, sharecropping, convict leasing, and just general humiliation. Right. That's when we, as black folk, were at our best. We typically are at our best when we understand that the government is not going to look out for us. And if you look at the institutions that were built during Jim Crow, HBCUs, black fraternities and sororities, African-American church denominations, the Church of God in Christ, other Pentecostal denominations, African-American newspapers, civil rights organizations, NAACP, the National Urban League, National Council for Negro Women. We do our best when we have nobody else to rely upon. Before I go horse, all right? So all of the Gnashing, uh, all of the gnashing of teeth and the woe is me. And I don't know, I'm a brother from Cleveland, Ohio, and one thing I appreciate about white folks in the South, I spent nine years as a professor at LSU, I've been at Texas for 10 years, went to school at Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi, 1400 Lynch Street, established 1878. 10,000 black folk, and that school was more diverse than any other school I've been at. But we typically are at our best, and what I appreciate about white Southerners is that they just straight up with you. <laughs> they just straight up, and I can appreciate that. And I told a lot of my white liberal friends at UT, I wish you were just honest with me. So you know how to deal with Trump, because he's straight up, and he told y'all what he was going to do. <laughs> and I wish some of our black politicians were just as courageous. You elected me, I got two years, I got four years, I'm going to do what I want to do, and if you vote me out, you vote me out. That's right, right. So the challenge for us, and I, and I want to talk about the Jim Crow period, this is critical because these were extraordinary people, they were ordinary folks just like us, but motivated to make an impact. I teach 1,200 undergrads at UT in the spring semester in two classes, and in the, and in the fall semester, in the spring semester, I teach a class in the law school. And one of those classes has 600 first-year students, and my goal as a professor is to get 300 of them to change their major within the first two weeks of school. <laughs> we never ask students what they love or what God has called them to do. We say, what you want to major in? And typically, we're majoring in X, but we're passionate about Y. And so we set it up where I will do X for 40 hours a week for 40 years, and then on the weekend, or when I get Sometimes I'll do why. Where my students? My students in the house. We got students in here. Let me talk to y'all for a minute. We choose a major based on three reasons. The first is parental influence. Parents, y'all ain't gonna y'all give me no amens on this, but it's okay. Parents, you cannot live through your children. That's right. Your children cannot live for you. You don't know how many students I have who come in my office in the fall crying, Dr. Mark, I hate engineering. 
Well, why are you majoring in that? Well, my daddy said, tell your daddy to get a degree in engineering. <laughs> and parents, I know you mean well, but you don't realize the pressure you're putting your children under. You want them to live your dream because you just want to post it and say, oh, my daughter's at AM and she's majoring in biomedical engineering. She may want to go to prayer if you major in social work. That's yeah, that's right. So young people, you got to major in what you want to major in. Because with that physics and that calculus and that organic chemistry kicking your butt, yeah. <laughs> mama and daddy ain't nowhere around. Yeah. And the danger for us is that too often we are choosing a vocation and now you are competing with people in that field who were born, people born to do that. Right. I tell folk I'm the best history professor in the world. My classes fill up at UT in two days. And I was going to send a statement by teaching the class in the largest building on campus. It's an auditorium. It seats 1,100 people. Because the folks were getting on my nerves. And I say, I'm about to just go completely for the kill. <laughs> so I told the course schedule, I said, Jerry, put me in Hall Auditorium. 1,100 students. He said, Dr. Moore. Please don't do that. He said, because if you do that, they won't take nobody else's class, they're going to take your class, and your colleagues are going to be mad at you. Let them be mad. Yeah, that's right. I don't want to be a team player for this year. Okay. Oh. But I believe I'm good because I was crazy enough to do what God has called me to do. That's all right. That's right. Finished high school with a 1.6 grade point average. Mm. Fifth father, my brother laughed at me. All right? All right? All right? <laughs> 1.6 grade point average, 15 ACT. But a good kid. My typical report card was four C's and two D's. That ain't that bad. <laughs> Polite, acting in church, right? Not disrespectful, not a thug, not going to jail, not disrespecting women. School was just boring. Yeah. Right. I remember the third grade asking the teacher, why do we have to memorize the states and their capitals? If I'm going to California, I can just look on a map and see that Sacramento is the capital. <laughs> Went to Jackson State, and here's what I love about black colleges. Spring break. <laughs> 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 I got a 1.8 GPA. So actually, I was doing better in college than I was doing in high school. <laughs> Went to my professor's class. I didn't think I was drunk. I didn't think I was drunk. Knew I'd be drinking. Well, I thought wrong, OK? He pulled me to the side, Dr. Davis. He said, hey, man. He said, take your ASS back to Cleveland and quit wasting your daddy's money. Mm -hmm. The conversation was transformational. Mm -hmm. When I don't like parents about this generation, we baby our kids. Too much. Right. My middle daughter tried out for the volleyball team. She's gifted in that competitive cheer. So she wakes up two days before trials and say, Daddy, I'm going to try out for the volleyball team in school. I said, you ain't going to make the team. Because <laughs> the white girls play volleyball year round. Dad. Dr. Moore, you shouldn't have told your daughter that you're going you to kill her dreams. She didn't make, she ain't good. <laughs> wow. She was wasting her time. Then she tried out for the basketball team. Come on, Lauren. No, Daddy, they don't like me. No, you can't play basketball either. <laughs> you good at jumping and doing flips and running track. But he challenged me, and he was right. And so we got to quit babying our kids. Moms, you got to cut the cord on your son who's a grown man. That's right. That's right. Quit raising his children. Quit referring to that your baby. He's 43. It's <laughs> laying up at your house. All right, let me move on. So anyway. So being a history major, you know, you black, you know, I major in history. What you gonna do with that? He think he gonna be Malcolm X? They will laugh. They don't laugh no more. Because 
of you, look at my high school transcript, the only class on there other than the only academic course on my transcript that was higher than a C was African American history. <clears throat> at 13, I would get up on a Saturday and take the bus downtown Cleveland and go to the public library and read black newspapers on microfilm from the 1920s and 30s. It's what I love, and I was just crazy enough to be what God called me to be. So young people, you gotta choose them. You can't worry about parental influence. The second reason we choose a major, the sexiness factor. What? The what? You're standing amongst a group of students, well, what you major in? Oh, I'm majoring in aerospace engineering. That sounds real sexy though. And somebody said, well, I'm majoring in education. <laughs> we pick and made this based on how they sound. And I got students at UT popping pills at night, having anxiety attacks, depressed, because they up at 2 and 3 in the morning studying and still not get, having success. So students, if that's you, God is trying to tell you, go change your major. You got to have some success out of stuff. And the third reason we choose a major is because somebody told us, who typically ain't got no money, that we can't make money doing that. That's right. That's right. You can't make no money doing that. Well, I ain't asked you for no money. <laughs> and so young parents, I've got to tell you, our kids are, are having, aren't having success because we just checking boxes on the major. And we got to change the conversation. What has God called you to do? I wake up every morning. After being at LSU nine years in Texas for 10, I wake up every morning and I, I challenge myself, how can I level the playing field for black students at UT? They come from Dallas and Houston and Beaumont and Waco and Love and Killeen. And they get on the campus seeing the white students in Range Rovers and Benzes and Teslas and Maseratis. And it can be intimidating. So I have this crazy idea. I said, what can I do to get these black kids an advantage? Because sometimes you can't compete with wealth. That's right, that's right. I said, well, what if I got them some global internships? What if I took these kids with all this street smarts, combine it with the book stuff, and package that with some global internships? And it is amazing when you just ask God to help you. So it came to five countries moving the needle globally. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Two weeks after thinking about this stuff, I got an email from the Koch Foundation. They wanted, they, they wanted to send more American students to study in China. Dear some radical, I filled out the application. They gave me $150,000. Now, check this out. I had never been to China. Can't speak Mandarin. Can't speak it now. We got this money. I fly to China the first time to set the program up. I contact the people. I say, um, do you need me to send a picture? Do you need me to send you a picture of me so you know what I look like? They said, we don't know who you are when we see you. <laughs> I come through the airport two in the morning. Some of the stuff in Beijing is in English. Now, you know, if you're in another country, you can figure out Spanish, you can figure out some other stuff. You can't figure out them characters. <laughs> and I said, if they don't come pick me up, we as we stuck. Three Chinese brothers uh, pulled up, they showed me a piece of paper, like, yeah, that's me. Ran through the streets of Beijing at three in the morning. And it didn't hit me I was in Beijing until I woke up the next morning in the hotel and turned on the TV. I said, damn, I can't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> Set the program up. And then, and then my good colleagues at UT, good white folk at UT, good people, Dr. Moore, now if you don't get 10 students, we got to cancel the program. I can get 10 students walking to the bathroom. <laughs> Because they didn't believe black folk were interested in studying abroad. Right. I said, no, we ain't never been presented to us. All right. And I said, the physical location of the study abroad office in UT was over there in Sorority Road. Mm -hmm. Black students didn't go over there. Mm -hmm. We 
to 48 students the first time? Wow. You know what it's like when you take us abroad? Yeah. You know what it's like when we go? Yeah. One student said, Dr. Moore, how do we buy our plane tickets? Now, <laughs> one student said, Doc, what do we do with our clothes and stuff when we're on the plane? He didn't know you checked the bags. And you know what it's like to get a kid from the hood, from Fifth Ward, Houston, who ain't never been nowhere, and that kid get a passport? <laughs> We over in China, we spend one weekend at a rural village. Now these black folk now, we get up at three in the morning, do a three hour hike up a hill. At six in the morning, we get there, we sitting on the Great Wall, and you see the sun come up. So, he had China on lock. I say, no, nah, we gotta pimp it out. <laughs> we gonna add another country. And it's unheard of for a person to have two study abroad. Wow. So I told my boy, we got China, let's do Cape Town. Because my goal there was, I want a kid to travel with us after their freshman year, after their sophomore year. Uh -huh. So before they become a junior, you look on their resume, and we tell them, you come to China with us, you're gonna put it on your resume in Mandarin. And when you come to South Africa with us, you're going to put it on there in Zulu and Afrikaans. So when you're applying for the internship on Wall Street or Silicon Valley or on Capitol Hill, and they're going through 500 applications, who is this sister from Killeen, Texas, who have been all over the world? Mm. One of my students from Skyline High School, and this brother, he'll tell you, I yelled at him to study abroad. He was going to go home and go to summer school. He was talking to Dr. Moore, he yelled at me. He had never been on a plane before. The first time this brother gets on a plane, we go from Austin to London, get to London at 9 a.m., got a 12 hour day over to London. We go see London, get back on the plane at midnight, we wake up the next morning, we in Cape Town. So in the span of 24 hours, this brother had been in two cities. He hooked now. The following year, he goes to China with us, but on his way to China, him and his boy stop in Dubai for two days. <laughs> we just go stop for two days. <laughs> and on the way home, they went to Hong Kong. The following semester, he studied abroad the entire semester by himself in Singapore. Wow. Wow. Come on, now this is, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So I'm motivated by that. That's what I believe God has called me to do. So students, you got to, number one, pursue what you love, and number two, people, you got to want a desire to have an impact. I don't find enough black folk who want to make an impact. We want to look cute. Yeah, that's right. And we pursue popularity over purpose, and money over mission, and impression over impact. But is that what we're here for? So you gotta have a desire to make an impact. And I tell my students, act like you belong. Yeah. Quit going in the rooms and classes silent and quiet and not asking questions. That's right. When I got to Ohio State for my PhD program, I love this. First day of our, our grad program, people, they, they said, stand up, introduce yourself, and where you went to school. People saying UC Berkeley, Princeton, Georgetown, Stanford. I'm like, I can't wait till they get to me. <laughs> Jackson State University, where everybody is somebody. They said, Jackson State? Yeah, Walter Payton? Oh, I got enough. I got enough. <laughs> but you got to come and compete. And I remember when I was working on my PhD, it hit me. The black man students had a party every year. And you know, we love the black folk party. It was a Mardi Gras party. The man students would come from all over the area. And you know, being a single brother with confidence. <laughs> All right? So the party was on Saturday evening at 7 o'clock. My boy, who's a professor at Illinois now, he comes by my apartment at about noon. You know, it would take a while to get ready for a party. So we were drinking a little bit, cracking jokes and stuff like that, watching the game. The entire time, the Asian brother across the hall from me had his computer going. When we leave to go to the party, the Asian brother's typing. When we come back from the party drunk, the Asian brother is typing. 
Yeah. When I get up at one the next day, I'm over the Asian brother type. And I said, you know what? I'm never going to get out of here. So I tell the young people for about 16 years, from about 1996 to about 2013-14, I got up every day at 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. So young people, you gotta have some grind about you. Yeah, right. And don't give me the stuff with dog no, I ain't that smart. It, 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 it amazed me how if you actually study, school is easy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and if you actually look at the material, it's easy. <laughs> so I tell folks the PhD program was a breeze. Did it in my sleep. But where's your grind? Where's your hustle? These brothers and sisters in the street can hustle like nobody else. That's right. But when they come to this environment, they get scared. You got to be versatile. That's right. I told folks, I didn't see a roach till I went to Jackson State. <laughs> <laughs> I'm primarily a suburban kid, went to church in the hood, all right? But guess what? I knew how to operate in the hood. All right. Yeah. I know if I'm on the south side of Chicago, and I gotta walk into a McDonald's, I'm in the wild hundreds. I gotta get out of the car with this attitude like, you better not even test me. And I'm scared to death on the inside. <laughs> but you gotta grind. Nobody's giving you anything. And let me tell you this, I tell folks, we can't say that the white folk in Michigan, Ohio, in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, who voted for Trump are racist, they voted for Barack in 2008 and 2012. That's right. There are no more jobs. Mm -hmm. And we as black folk, we've gotten everything we gonna get. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> and you know, we used to we used to be able to scare people and saying you racist. I believe Trump at some point is gonna say, maybe I am, what you gonna do about it? <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta hustle. You gotta grind, you gotta surround yourself with a dream team. My best friend teaching Illinois, my other best friend teaching Northwestern. We were in Grass Hill, Ohio State, wearing Air Jordans, baggy jeans, polo hoodies, 21, 22 years old, and we were killing it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But we knew how to party, but we also knew how to knock out the 35 page paper. When I first got the grass, I thought if you just wrote a minimum of 20 pages, it was an automatic eight. I'm like, dog, how do you even see on the paper, man? I put all the time into it. <laughs> So you gotta get a dream team and you gotta surround yourself with folks who are going somewhere. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, we don't like to like cut folks off. We loyal. We some loyal people. My best friends went to kindergarten together all the way up. We all started college the same semester. All four of them flunked out. We still boys, but guess what? We don't have nothing in common. Because they doing the same thing in 2017 that we were doing in 1989. So all we can do is get together and watch the Cavs and watch the Browns, and that is pretty much it. I had one with brothers, man, what you, what you doing this summer? Man, I'm trying to decide. I told you all the time. My kids been on five continents. We got two to go. Antarctica and Australia. And Antarctica is expensive as hell. You only save like two hours. <laughs> And what motivated me for that is because I remember growing up, the, the elementary school teacher would be like, well, what did you all do for the summer? Uh -huh. And all the black folks say, we went to grandma's house. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Other folks say, Disneyland, Disney World. <laughs> so my son's in the fifth grade. This year, teacher said, what y'all do this summer? We went back to South Africa, then we stopped in Dubai. He put it down. <laughs> <laughs> But we all going this summer. I don't, he said, I don't know my daddy. We ain't decided yet. <laughs> but it's by exposure. Yes, and so I've got to surround myself with people who have got similar goals. And I can't surround myself with people who are envious or jealous. One more point I'm out here. Young people, y'all got to start being a little more racially. Y'all got to start being a little tougher. I get disrespected every day on campus. Remember when I was a professor teaching at LSU? 
I went to the library one day, had maybe jeans and a shirt on. I wasn't teaching that day. And as a faculty member, you can check a book out for an entire semester. I don't know why you need it that long, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> so they checked the book out, and the little student worker says, you a professor? I said, they told me I was. <laughs> she said, let me look at my manager. Yeah, took my ID, go to the back, manager come out, look at my ID, look at the screen, you're a professor? I thought so. <laughs> she said, oh, I just need to double check. Really? The year before I left LSU, I was walking out of the union, thought I dressed similarly, jeans and a shirt on, and a white kid said, good luck tomorrow. <laughs> the next day, LSU was playing Auburn. He thought it was a football team. I'm at a faculty senate meeting at UT last academic year. I have an endowed professorship. I think I'm doing all right. The chair of the English department is sitting in front of me at the meeting. Shaka Smart, the basketball coach, is there giving a presentation. The chair of the English department thought I was an assistant basketball coach. Because in his mind, if you were a black man in this environment, you got to be here somewhat related to basketball and football. You know, when we went to China, we took about 12 black males with us. And about four of those brothers, like 6'2", six, 6'3", six, it was crazy. And the first thing they asked us in China, are y'all here studying? They said, about basketball. Are y'all here studying? So you got to get a thick skin. You can't protest everything. We're going to do more. They threw some eggs on the MLK statue. What should we do? Go wipe it off and go to the library. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to deal with it. But I'm not going to let them throw me off my game. Dr. Moore, you don't even talk about you. Well, I'll get to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to get a thick skin. Some people ain't going to like you. Some black folk ain't going to like you. That's right. <laughs> but you just got to keep grinding and moving forward. Whenever I go in my office at UT late at night, I call the campus police. That's right. Dr. Moore, man, I'm going to Garrison Hall. Well, Dr. Moore, why are you calling us? Because I don't want you to think I'm stealing and shooting me. That's right. <laughs> 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 my neighbor, me and my wife, built our house in Austin when we got this brand about 2007. Now, my neighbor moves to next door to me five years later, 2012, 2013. Good guy. So he comes out. He said, Litter. He said, Yeah, man, I heard you work at UT. I said, Yeah. He said, You in athletics? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Every single day. And I'm going to throw me off my game. No, man. God is wrong with me. See, when I tell church folk, it's easy to sing those songs on Sunday morning, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking about the head, not the tail, and all this other stuff. People prophesying. And you go to the job and sell out on Monday. Oh. <laughs> yes, sir. So that's why the point of said a lot of us are Christian atheists. We believe in God, but we act like he doesn't exist. Yeah. And so if I know God got me placed at UT, mm -hmm. he's going to tell me where it's time for me to go. Yeah. And folk, when I always say, no, no, you, you can't you talk about Jesus. If I talk about booty, you wouldn't have a problem with it. That's right. That's right. That's right. If I talk to some of those, you got a problem with So you got to just do what you do. And lastly, we don't do enough of this. We got to start celebrating our success. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We took that brother Barack for granted, didn't we? That's right. That's right. One thing I learned from Martin Luther King, you never criticize another black person in public. Right. As much as Malcolm dogged him out, he never spoke a negative word about another black person in public. So one regret I had was when I was on six, when I was on time during the morning show on 60 Minutes After Katrina, I was very critical of New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagin. I called him an Oreo. And you know why I did it? Because I knew we would get headlines. But I shouldn't have done that. But I'm saying, we took Barack for granted. I don't know, how, how did y'all feel when y'all was watching the inauguration and we saw Barack and Michelle getting a helicopter? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
We dog that brother out. That's right. Don't feel it. Didn't realize what we had. And I tell the sisters, Trump bad enough. His wife even worse. No education. Don't even say she's staying in the corner. Y'all can laugh at that. I'm gonna tell the truth. <laughs> Michelle Obama, undergrad degree from Princeton, law degree from Harvard. Obama was her intern. But my point about celebrating success, a lot of us are achievement oriented. I've been guilty of that. But sometimes you guys got to stop and kick it and enjoy. So students, the one thing I love about America, and it's hit me when I was in South Africa, South Africa has 55 million people, eight universities what we will call universities in the U.S. Right. There ain't no financial aid. There's no such entity as financial aid. That's right. there, there's no such thing. You got the money you don't. Yep. In America, you can be dirt poor, but through a grant, a loan, on, and what I love about the first day of college, brother, everybody equal. So you at Central Texas College, you have no excuse because all you need is a 3.0 and 30 credit hours, and you can transfer to any university pretty much in the country, and they don't even look at your test scores no more. So what you gonna do? I tell folk, future and these idiots, the hip hop nonsense, I don't know what it is, but we glorify it. I think our enemies sit back and just point at them. So students, you can do whatever you want to do. And I think for some of us, that's scary. It's scary. We don't realize how much we are in control of our own destiny. It felt good when I was on ESPN in 07, 08, 09, and 60 Minutes, and CNN, and the New York Times did a cover story on me. It felt good, but I can't live for that. Man, God, are you proud of me? The impact I'm trying to make. So young people, the excuse making is over. You gotta change your mentality. I became a better person when I stopped listening to hip-hop. <coughs> but some of the brothers so ingrained in me, if I get gin and juice and all that stuff, <laughs> guess what, it's coming back. <laughs> I know I'm gonna hear it. I hear two live crew, all that stuff. <laughs> 99, 90, all right, it come back. And I tell folk, music is a spirit. And most folks in the black church don't shout when ain't no music going on. And when the music stops, we just automatically, we just naturally sit down, all right? <laughs> you, know, you gotta watch what you put up in here. And let me tell the young sisters this. We lost two generations of black women, yeah. I believe. Because their whole identity was centered around having a man. Mm -hmm. I remember being, being at LSU, these sharp, attractive young sisters, dating brothers not even in college. He lived in her apartment, driving the car. Her daddy bought her. And I'm like, he just dropped you off. Where he going? <laughs> and brothers, y'all got we got to raise the standard on man. So I've been married 15 years. He never cheated, he never had no side piece. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. <laughs> he said the amen is a little loud over there, huh? Amen. Amen. All right, all right. All right. All right. may have a couple, couple minutes for question and answer. Uh, well, folks, this has been awesome. I would love to hear what you do. Thank you. <laughs>